That's right, Andy began preaching at 13, eight years ago. <laughs> and to, okay. Some of you've noticed I've changed over the years. My hair is lighter than it used to be. My ears are no bigger than they used to be. <laughs> but Pepperdine has been an important part of the spiritual journey that has been my life. And I will always be indebted to Jerry Rushford and now in continuity to Mike Cope, certainly to Dr. Benton, who honored me simply by calling me friend as well as brother, and so many of you from so many other times, places, and many of you only and ever here, but a point of important connection between us. Every human life must find its meaning in someone else's account of what the world is and what it means to be authentically human. And my claim in this lecture tonight is that an authentically human life must find its meaning in Jesus Messiah. I would even want to add this against the church speak vocabulary of urging people to invite Jesus into their lives. I think it is far more biblical that we should invite people to hear the words, Jesus is inviting you into his life. Jesus doesn't want any space in my tiny little cramped, dull, sinful life. He wants me, though, to have a full share of his expansive and abundant, God-honoring and others' blessing life. And that's an invitation worth taking to the whole world. I think, in fact, we could call it good news. Let's pray and look at a text. Holy triune God, thank you, blessed Father, for sharing the gift of the life-giving Son to be shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And may we live in that story, proclaim that story, and live in confident hope as that story opens out into your everlasting kingdom of light. Amen. We're all players in scripts we didn't write. And each of us steps on stage and is forced to improvise wherever he or she is within the story. And I will assure you, you'll do better with your improv if you know the story well into which you have just stepped. The better you know the story, the better the hope that you're going to move it forward in some positive way. That's true for all of us, no exceptions. The late Leslie Newbigin argued that really there are only two stories. You can dress them up in different ways, you can, you can parse them a bit differently, but really there are only two. They are very different stories, they're contrasting stories. One of them may be summed up in Shakespeare's line about human lives that ultimately signify nothing. Perhaps beyond self-preservation and procreation, we're, we're carriers of DNA in a hostile environment full of sound and fury. We struggle for survival, and only the fittest few make it. And it will someday end in death, cold death for all of us, and then only the beat of the DNA will go on. The other story is rooted in an account of a purposeful, loving creator, a good God who created males and females in His own image and likeness to bear that image into a good creation that He made for them to enjoy. Because of human sin, though, even God's story has a lot of sound and fury in it. But we cannot escape the sovereign intentions of God to bring that story back fully round to its beginning point. And in a new heaven and a new earth, God will have reclaimed everything that He created and it will be His again. And it will be as beautiful as He intended for it to be. We can't escape the two stories. It's a biblical story unfolding across time. Oh, it's rooted in eternity past and it opens out into eternity yet to come. 
It's the story, yes, of paradise lost and paradise regained. It's a story that in this bubble that we call space-time history is rooted very much in Abraham of Ur, but reaches its grand climax in Jesus of Nazareth. It's the story in which I have enlisted and in which God has graciously enrolled me. And somewhere around the midpoint of the first century, Paul told a body of Christians in the capital city of the mighty Roman Empire that they needed to get clear about what they had done in relation to Jesus and this Jesus story. A story far more significant than the story of the empire and its legions or Caesar and loyalty to him. He told them, you made a confession. Some of you either missed the heart of that confession or didn't understand the confession you were making. And so he, he writes, You've been enrolled in this significant story. Embrace the story in which you have been embraced by God. And he writes it this way. What are we to say then? Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore we have been buried with Him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Now the first thing I would observe about that text is, it's not an evangelistic text and it's not a baptismal text. It's a discipleship text. It's a text written to people who are already believers. It's not written to explain to them the mode of baptism or the purpose of baptism or the meaning of baptism. The question at hand was, do you realize what you've done? It's like the question some of you women ask yourself the morning after your wedding day when you woke up and looked over here to your side and you said, what have I done? And then you blinked and you said... I have given myself to a man who loves me with all of his heart and I will have the rest of my life to love him back and we in loving one another will advance the kingdom of God in love. Oh, maybe these weren't the, the exact words, but <laughs> I hope that's what it's worked out to. So Paul is in effect saying to them, some of you need to wake up to what you've done and realize the significance and carry out the meaning. You did it in a moment, but it will take your lifetime to discover all of its meaning. I'm not convinced, for example, that Paul would understand our contemporary language about baptism as an outward sign of an inward commitment. That sort of dualism is very modern. I don't think it's in Jewish or Christian thought. I don't think Isaiah or Paul would, would either get that mindset of, well, with my heart and my mind I did this, but my body was doing something else. In fact, that sounds much more Gnostic than it sounds Jewish or Christian. Oh, I, I may know some people who are heirs to those Gnostic heresies. It's the man who tells his wife that he loves her with all of his heart and that this business of hitting only happens once in a while and he doesn't know where it comes from. Or he loves her with all that he is and, and what happened with that person is, is meaningless. It, it, didn't, it didn't really mean anything to me. Maybe it's like the woman in Detroit who, who explained in the press recently that she's a devoted Christian and she was only selling cocaine because she needed the money. Well, the Gnostic could say, well, with my body I lie, or with my body I murder, or with my body I fornicate, but God saved my spirit. And the inner me is not contaminated by that. That's just not biblical. Biblically, what you say, whatever comes up, comes out, it, it, it's not just the tongue, it's revealing. Well, an NBA owner found that out over the last few days. 
What's in you does come out. What you do with your body does go in. You are holistic before God. And therefore, Paul says, don't be presenting the members of your body as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God. You've been brought from death to life. Present your members now as instruments of righteousness. So Paul says... This rhetorical question had somehow been put to him. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Somebody says, nobody would ever ask Paul a stupid question like that. Well, back in 3.8 in the book of Romans, he said, people have been pressing that point with me. Paul said, I've explained that, that Jewish unrighteousness has led to the opening up of righteousness to not just Jews, but Gentiles as well. And he says, these people are liars. Their condemnation as liars is deserved because they say, well, sin, since it resulted in righteousness, sin's really not such a serious matter after all. Paul said, I never said that. Rubel, if you go on talking about grace, 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 and God's grace being so great as to reach sinners where they are, they're going to get the idea that they can stay right where they are. Really. Sounds like what was put to Paul. Or Jesus saved me just as I am. How how dare you now judge me and say that this relationship or that behavior or that failure is sinful. Paul says there's a perversion of logic going on here. If anybody wants to say that the preaching of grace amounts to a license to sin, the preaching of grace is the greatest motivation to cease sin. Because it affirms the fact that because of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, there's no motivation anymore to sin. And we have been not only forgiven of the past, but we have been set free from any bondage to sin. The thrust of his argument is pretty clear, it seems to me. To die to a thing is to be released from bondage or obligation or commitment to it. And that seems to be central to his thought here. He'll use it again in chapter 7 about marriage commitment and about covenant. Here he's simply saying, if you were joined with the death of Christ, if you were baptized into His death, then... (laughs) You changed spheres. You moved from darkness to light. You moved from sin to pardon. You moved from one world to another. If we were in bondage to sin, and we were, because we were in Adam, which is his argument back in 5.12 beginning, we've been set free now because we're in Jesus, at verse 15, to live in righteousness and life. Out of the deadness now we have come to a new kind of life. There's newness of life in Christ. And it was signified to us in the waters. But when? How? When did I die to sin or change my citizenship from this world to to the kingdom of God? Was there a funeral service for me? Was there swearing in and a naturalization service into my new citizenship? You bet there was. There was a tangible physical event that was God's way of testifying to me when I was 12 years old, when I didn't really get all of it. And I've tried to spend the rest of my life growing into the meaning of it. That God has started a work of grace in me. God has started a work of grace in you. God has started a transforming miracle of grace in the life of everyone who's gone into those waters with Him. Because you entered by baptism into the death of Christ and now you have been brought to newness of life in Him. Don't you know that all of us, Paul says, who've been baptized into Christ Jesus We're baptized into His death. Therefore, we've been buried with Him by baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. People who've been in bondage to addictions, alcohol, drugs, sex, I think sometimes they appreciate being set free and liberated in a way. Some of us who grew up in the church... 
and maybe didn't get quite that far away from God in some of those behaviors, don't. Now understand, I would not have ever gone to those places for the sake of appreciating newness of life. I'm not sure I'm strong enough that I ever could have come back. Addictions are strong and those powers are mighty. They're the powers of Satan. I remember being asked several years ago now to do a singles retreat at a state park in, I think it was the state of Georgia, but it was in a, a southern climate. And I went there and started on Friday afternoon. They wanted me to do five presentations on the cross of Jesus Christ. And so I began on Friday afternoon with a, just a basic introductory lesson about the meaning of the cross and talked about death to old life and coming to life anew in Christ. And just as I was wrapping up the first presentation, I noticed in that group of about 120 that as I was quitting, ending with a prayer, passing it off for the 20 minutes of announcements that would be, you know, that first session, one girl got up and it seemed to me that she was upset. She was dabbing her eyes and she walked out onto the porch and so when I finished the prayer and yielded to the person with all the announcements, I followed her out. And I said, I'm not trying to be intrusive. I'm not trying to be nosy, but you seem upset. I'm wondering, could it have been something I said? No, no, she said. She said, it's just that I, I don't know why I'm here. I came because a girlfriend invited me and she's a close friend and but I don't, I don't fit here. I don't belong. And she started telling me some of the pain in her life that was behind those scalding tears falling. And she ended it by saying, I don't belong here. I just want to die. And so with all the compassion of my heart, I looked her in the eyes. I had to get low to get an angle. I said, I can help you. I want to die. I can help you. I got a bit of a strange look, but I, I was intending to try to get her attention. She looked up and she said, what? <laughs> and I opened my Bible, this very Bible, to the same text that I've just read to you. And I said, all of those terrible things that you've named, the hurt you endured and the way you acted out and the things that you're so ashamed of and you want to die, do you realize Jesus took all that and He died for you and He's inviting you now to die to all of that, to enter with Him into His death so He can bring you into newness of life? And then she started sobbing. And this time it was not the scalding bitter tears of shame and pain. They honestly were tears of joy. And she began to say, could it be? Was I meant to be here this weekend? Was I supposed to hear this? I read the text. In fact, I passed the Bible and I said, why don't you clear your eyes of the tears? Why don't you read the text back to me? Do you hear that and can you believe that? And that that text is for you? She said, I do want to die, but I want to live. I want to die to everything that I've just talked to you about and confessed to you that, that's been killing me. And I want to come into this new life. They were still making announcements on the inside. So I said, why don't we go inside and, and let's share the joy. I wanted to affirm the decision she just made. Frankly, I wanted her to be affirmed in it so she wouldn't pull away from it over the course of the weekend. And I said, let's go inside and let's tell them about the conversation you and I have had, the personal conversation about the meaning of the cross for you. And let's tell them about that. And, and then Sunday morning when we're back at, at the church building, she said, Sunday morning, I want to do that right now being much more biblical at that moment than I was. <laughs> but it was November. Fortunately, not in Michigan, but in Georgia. 
And so we did, in fact, go in. They were about to release. I said, hold it, hold it, hold it. Need you to know about. Told them the story I've just told you. And I said, you see the lake about a mile away? We're going to the lake right now, and we're going to seal this. And so... I'll call her Judy. That's not her name. She took my arm and we led a procession of 120. And we walked down. And I stood at the edge and I opened this very Bible and read these very verses again. And I explained to the group. I said, Judy is about to die. And the thing to do with a dead person is to bury her. I'm going to bury her. Say goodbye to her. She's leaving you. She's leaving an old life. You'll never see this Judy again. And sure enough, on cue, as we were walking out into the water. (laughs) Bye, Judy. Judy, bye. So long, Judy. I let her confess her faith in Christ and I slugged her down into the water and I pulled her back up and we started moving rather quickly (laughs) out of the water and where it was... And on cue, without being prompted, people were saying, Rubel, who's that with you? Introduce us to the new person that you brought to meet us. We want to know her. We'd like to get acquainted with her. We'd like for her to be part of We want to be part of her. I've thought about that event a bazillion times since that day, wishing that every baptismal event could be that dramatic. Mine was just a 12-year-old boy on a July night. And water about that cold because we didn't have baptistry heaters back then. But the drama of baptism is meant to be real. The drama of it is that it's an incorporation into a story so much bigger than anything we are about. And God is now enlisting us in the story of Jesus, buried with Him, raised with Him. Entering His death so we now can enter into newness of life with Him. The full force of that text for the radical event of of having one's life uprooted and transplanted in new soil. Eugene Peterson gets it in the message. So what do we do? Keep on sinning so God can keep on forgiving? I should hope not. If we've left that country where sin is sovereign, how can we still live in our old house there? Or didn't you realize we packed up and left there for good? That's what happened in baptism. When we went under the water, we left the old country of sin behind. When we came up out of the water, we entered into the new country of grace. New life in a new land. That's not a false doctrine of baptismal regeneration. Paul didn't believe water saved anybody. I don't think we've ever believed it, though sometimes in our eagerness to defend the place of baptism we've come across, people have heard us saying it. Maybe some of us have at time or place. But my fear is, in some of our insistence on the importance of baptism, maybe letting it be heard as baptismal regeneration, some have retreated and pulled back and almost treated baptism as if it doesn't really matter at all. It's a trivial thing. It's a nuisance that gets my hair wet and I have to take a few minutes to dry it off. But what Paul says is precisely on point. Baptism is a meaningful symbol whose meaning is found in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ and the importance of it is not in the event we perform. The importance, the significance, the salvific power of it is in what it confesses and claims. If baptism is depreciated, doesn't that set one up for the very thing Paul is arguing against here? Mightn't somebody miss the significance of it if it is depreciated? I affirm the significance of it and try always with every person that I've ever baptized to make sure they understand not that I'm not going to drown them, but that what they're doing is significant. It's important. It is a marker in your spiritual journey unlike any other. I remember a Sunday in Jerusalem with Joseph Shula. Max Lucato and I were there. We both spoke in that service. A young woman came at the end 
and told her story of conversion through reading the Gospels with some friends at university, only to have been beaten within an inch of her life by her father and her brother and told if she ever had further contact with them, there would be more of that. And if she were ever to be baptized, they seemed to know it was something really significant. She would die. It would be an honor killing for their family. And there she was that Sunday confessing her faith through tears, Joseph standing beside her, I think at times to keep her from collapsing. And we went and she was baptized and she had a family. But it was a family not by blood and DNA, but by the blood and water of Jesus Christ. I recall a Sunday in Kenya preaching from Philippians 2, 6 to 11. And after that... One of the lost boys of Sudan asked to be baptized and I baptized him in a wooden trough with a tin lining. He regarded his baptism as a lost boy becoming a found soul. How I cherish the memory of a Sunday night in Moscow when a group of five women who met on Sunday evenings for worship found that an American was in, in, in their city delivering supplies to a children's hospital and, and invited me to be there and to take communion with them. And I did, and they said, well, would you speak to us out of Scripture? And I went to Philippians 2, 6 to 11, my favorite preaching text in all the world, and told the story of Jesus. And one lady, a dancer in the Bolshoi, who was there, said, I believe that story. I want to follow Jesus. May I be baptized? And so in an oversized bathtub in a Moscow apartment in the home of a mother and her daughter hosting us for communion, I baptized her. My own children, an 80-something with a knee that wouldn't bend, took three of us to get her in and out of the baptistry. A 15-year-old who was extraordinarily scared of water, it took 45 minutes of coaxing and to get a retired Catholic priest in a hotel pool, an organist for the Methodist church in a baptistry that caught fire three days later because the janitor forgot to turn the water off when he drained it to clean it. All of those, all of those experiences in my memory around the event. And in every case, I've tried to be sure that the person that I was baptizing understood what was happening here. Bath time, funeral time, spiritual birthday, new creation, pick the metaphor that works. You're being enlisted in the Jesus story and nothing can ever be the same for you again. When I was baptized, I gave up a citizenship and swapped it for a heavenly one. We died to an old country and an old way of thinking so we could come alive to a new world of grace and a new way of thinking and living. On the one hand, we have to be so careful not to reduce the gospel to a moral legalism that generates critical spirits and harsh actions. But on the other, we've got to stop flinching at the strong demands of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. If you have been baptized, there is no excuse for living in the old ways of the world and for embracing the dominant values of a culture that is not God-honoring. You've committed to the Jesus story. Think of it this way. God intends for your conversion to be more than enrolling in the university where you get a letter of acceptance or joining the club where you get a card to carry in your wallet. You're embracing Christ's death as your own. You are dying to everything that is against God's purpose in this story. You're renouncing the prince of darkness And you are coming alive into God's story to live in the light with Jesus and to walk in that light until it opens out into the very glory of God that is the light of that new heavenly Jerusalem. So when you are baptized, you confess in that event of baptism the death and the burial and the resurrection by reenacting it. You claim for yourself, what Jesus did there. Not what you're doing, but what He did. And you have a confidence going forward because you have this marker to hold in memory. This day, this event. 
a symbol, but no mere symbol. This wedding ring, it's a symbol of a relationship that I had with Myra, but it's no mere symbol. The flag that we stand and we hold our hearts and we repeat the Pledge of Allegiance, it's a symbol, but it's no mere symbol. In Scripture, baptism is a symbolic act, but no mere symbol. A significant life altering, entering into the death for the sake of newness of life in Christ. And Paul says, you Christians at Rome, some of you seem not to have gotten it. Your allegiance is not to Rome, it's to your heavenly citizenship. Your allegiance is not to Caesar, it is to King Jesus. And your values are not the values of the force of arms of Roman might. It is the power, the transforming power of the Spirit of God that works from within. So he's telling them, you've got to believe this. And show that you believe it by yielding your members to righteousness. I don't want to be like the Satanist who was quoted in USA Today. You remember the story of the 19-year-old, the confessed Satanist, arrested for a murder and then confessed to 22 more and it made big headlines. The, The press treated it with skepticism, probably appropriate skepticism. But USA Today went and interviewed a Satanist. I didn't know they had spokesmen, but they do. And the Satanist spokesman said, we Satanists are just creative people experimenting with our self-awareness and individuality. We don't really take all that talk about evil seriously. We don't even believe in the devil, he said. Most Satanists don't. Folks, Christians shouldn't be able to say anything that resembles that. We take this story seriously. We have been enlisted in it. We've been enrolled in it. We do believe in Jesus. But the only way you can prove that you do believe in Jesus is the full-on identification with who Jesus is in this newness of life. The world's values are not my values. So if you seem to some people to be too generous, just explain to them you take your faith seriously. If you're questioned about your kindness or your willingness to forgive... Tell them you died to meanness and you died to holding grudges when you died with Jesus. And if you or your child is mocked for prudish marital fidelity or or chastity, let them know, hey, I'm enrolled in the Jesus story. I know it's not the way of time and place, but it is the way of Jesus. And if you ever feel out of step with the entertainment or the conversation or the values of the generation, tell yourself, as Martin Luther said, he would have to tell himself in moments of temptation, but I've been baptized. Luther said, I would tell myself that to say, I ended those behaviors and relationships, and for the sake of Christ, I have embraced something that now I'm learning to live into. We're enrolled in the Jesus story. We're part of a great cosmic battle in which God is reclaiming everything that belongs to Him. He's going to get it back. We're His. He is our all in all. So let's live the account of God about what is real and what is meaningful and what is valuable. And even the things of this world that may be morally neutral hold even those with a very light grip. Anything that doesn't advance your relationship to Christ, it's okay just to turn it loose completely for the sake of this story. The Jesus story. And if like some of the people at Rome, you sort of let slip the significance of what you did. You don't have to go back and repeat it. You only be born once. You only have to go through this dying, rising process once. But give yourself the grace to renew and deepen the commitment and to begin living fully in the newness of this life. Because you're a player, a player in the Jesus story.
Our Father in heaven, you've let us pass through the Exodus waters from slavery to freedom. Now lead us through our perilous wilderness wanderings to the promised land. You've called us out of the old life of darkness and death into a new land of light and life. Now let us live in the newness of eternal life, empowered for righteousness and peace and joy by the Holy Spirit. You've given us new birth from above. Now let us live as your beloved and loving children until we're safely home with you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.